Typically, stars are viewed as incredibly brilliant balls of nuclear wrath. At least until they enter a post-normal star state, such as forming a black hole, neutron star, or white dwarf. In the early universe, however, star formation was a little different, and recent theories have posited the existence of a type of star that is not at all like a typical main-sequence star. Hello everyone, welcome back to Z, in this video we will try to demonstrate the anti-supernova and dark stars. Subscribe to our channel and ring the bell, so you won't miss any update. About 80 to 100 million years after the Big Bang, the hydrogen and helium clouds of the universe began to settle. This peculiar circumstance may have facilitated the formation of an odd first generation of stars dependent on dark matter. They could have been 500 to 1000 times more massive than the Sun and visibly much, much larger in diameter than the Sun. If these stars did exist, their fusion energy would have been very different from what we are familiar with. Dark stars, by definition, are cold and poorly defined, and they do not emit visible light, hence the name. However, they would do so on different wavelengths. Instead of nuclear fusion, they would have been propelled by the heating of dark matter. This may have allowed for two classes of early stars, stars dependent on dark matter as well as the first generation of normal stars producing heavier elements. Even the James Webb Space Telescope, which is designed to detect the earliest, most distant normal stars, has difficulty detecting these stars. The reason for this is that dark stars should emit gamma rays, neutrinos, and even antimatter, but not in the visible spectrum, making them extremely challenging to locate. They would likely congregate at the nuclei of early galaxies, as these are the regions with the highest concentration of dark matter. If dark matter can sustain star types, there should be additional evidence of its effect in neutron stars and white dwarfs at the centers of galaxies. However, this has not been observed. Again this is a problem for the existence of dark matter, but without it, it's an equal problem because our notions of gravitation at great distances are flat out wrong, and the evidence we do have for dark matter would still require an alternative explanation. However, it may be possible to investigate dark star mergers using gravitational wave instruments such as LIGO, which may be the simplest way to detect them. However, there is an anomaly here. In 2011, Hubble Space Telescope observations of one of the most distant galaxies ever detected revealed a peculiar infrared signature decrease. The problem is that it is difficult to confirm the observation with Hubble's capabilities, so no one is certain what this detection signifies other than a tantalizing suggestion that this peculiar type of star may exist or have existed in the past. If dark stars could be detected unequivocally, it would provide significant evidence for the existence of dark matter as a whole, which is a central question in cosmology. The James Webb Telescope has an advantage because supermassive dark stars should emit longer infrared wavelengths, which it can detect and which may better reveal their signature. Webb has already detected signatures from very young stars within stellar nurseries that were previously undetectable by any other telescope. Even if you could prove the existence of dark matter beyond its effect on galaxies and dark stars, this would not reveal what it is. And this may be the key to solving a new enigma that has emerged recently. There is a problem with antimatter. Antimatter has always been a hazy concept. We know it can exist because we can produce it in the lab. It doesn't last long, as antimatter is notoriously destroyed by normal matter upon contact. However, we inhabit a vast, mostly vacant universe where antimatter particles can travel for eons without encountering normal matter. This prompted the inquiry, if this is the case, where is all the antimatter that should have been produced in roughly equal quantities to normal matter during the Big Bang? Originally, the answer was that it could still be around, and that you could never distinguish the difference between a normal matter star and an anti-star because both behave similarly in other respects. They shine and function identically. In the intervening years, however, it has become possible to detect the presence of vast quantities of antimatter in the universe. The universe gives the impression that there are no significant quantities of antimatter outside of rare positron fountains, which are a mystery in and of themselves. At least that was the case until an experiment out of the blue and out of nowhere revealed enormous quantities of it.
In 2018, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer experiment mounted on the exterior of the International Space Station detected an anomaly. Scientists discovered what appeared to be two anti-helium nuclei in addition to six nuclei of another isotope. If that detection was genuine, which is still debatable, and it's based on a single instrument, then there's far too much antimatter for us to readily encounter with this experiment, and it's in a much more complex form than it should be. Despite the fact that the detector detects millions of times more conventional helium nuclei than anti-helium, the effect is still present in that it should not detect any anti-helium. There are numerous ways in which these particles could be created, but one possibility is that they are created in anti-star lingering somewhere in the cosmos. And the evidence seems to be accumulating. Another group of scientists linked the discovery of anti-helium to yet another enigma, strange gamma-ray sources detected by the Fermi Large Area Telescope that are also unexplained. Anti-star would typically appear identical to regular stars, emitting photons at the same wavelengths as their counterparts made of normal matter. However, space is not completely devoid of matter, so particles and gas should be plunging into anti-star and annihilating, producing gamma-ray bursts at very specific wavelengths. However, this is also possible with other astronomical sources of known origin, so these sources were excluded from the study, leaving 14 candidates for anti-star. If the observations continue to align with those of experiments detecting anti-helium, then the possibility of anti-stars will need to be thoroughly investigated. An issue is that there are 14 candidates, which is a large number, and it suggests that anti-stars are relatively common, which is difficult to accept. They should be uncommon. However, there are also anti-helium detections. Two natural processes are known to produce antiparticles, one of which is more hypothetical than the other. The first involves cosmic radiation, while the second involves the interactions of dark matter. The issue is that the likelihood of either of these possibilities being the perpetrator are extremely low, which suggests that anti-stars are more likely. This is due to the difficulty of forming a sizable antiparticle. Creating an antiproton is simple and can be accomplished in a laboratory. When dealing with antideuterium, however, the situation becomes more complicated and difficult. Even worse than antihelium, the heavier the atomic nucleus, the more difficult it is for antihelium to form outside of an antistar. So in nature, these are the possible routes to creating antiparticles. The first is from supernovae, which emanate high-energy cosmic rays. This process is called spallation, and it occurs when a high-energy particle travels through the interstellar medium until it collides with a gas or other object, which can result in an antiparticle. Six of the anti-helium detections were anti-helium-3, while only two were anti-helium-4. That level of complexity is statistically improbable to occur frequently enough through spallation to be easily detectable. This material was observed at the earliest moment we could detect it, if it occurs frequently in the universe. It's not impossible, but it's a step too far for nature, barring extremely unusual circumstances. The second is the enigmatic dark matter. This one is more ambiguous and in all honesty, on par with the notion of an anti-star emitting particles. Under certain conditions, dark matter particles, if it is indeed a particle, may annihilate and produce antiparticles, according to certain theories regarding dark matter. In addition to the possibility that this process does not exist, it would be extremely difficult to produce enough anti-helium, specifically anti-helium-4, in sufficient quantities for us to simply turn on a detector and see it immediately. Therefore, the anti-star option represents the optimal solution. The Achilles heel may be errors in the detection, which have not yet been eliminated, and the analysis and additional investigations are ongoing to verify the anti-helium detections. In other words, it could have all been an accident of the detector, and if it's never confirmed, the concept of anti-stars will return to the realm of pure speculation. However, suppose it comes out that anti-stars do exist. They would necessitate at least a modification to our current understanding of the evolution of the early universe, which is already occurring as a result of other unusual results from the James Webb Space Telescope discussed in another video. 
Nevertheless, if anti-stars exist, they would be genuine relics from the universe's earliest times, a phenomenon that is no longer forming. The clouds from which they originated would likely have disintegrated long ago upon contact with ordinary matter. How did the anti-stars survive for so long? This would also be a difficult question to answer, given that they probably should not have been present in such large numbers, assuming we are not in a unique situation, such as a jet of them pointed in our direction or one that is unusually near. Or they are created by a process of which we are unaware. However, another issue would be what the regulations are for anti-stars. If they behave like regular stars, do they adhere to the same mass and temperature classifications as regular stars? Was it ever possible for massive anti-stars to form that exploded in supernova and dispersed antimatter throughout the early universe? Exists any remaining evidence of that? Would it have been an even more catastrophic event than a normal supernova? Numerous concerns exist. But antimatter is an enigmatic substance, not in itself, as it is merely the antimatter counterpart to normal matter, which we know exists and can be produced, but in how nature generates it, both in the Big Bang and now. Antimatter positron fountains have been discovered in the Milky Way, and they likely exist in a significant number of galaxies throughout the universe. We still have no idea what is causing these enormous torrents of 15 billion tons of positrons per second, all we know is that they are annihilating. You can speculate that neutron stars or supermassive black holes create these conditions, but why don't they do so more frequently? You could also query anti-stars here, although it is difficult to imagine how one could survive in the galaxy's densest regions. However, it appears that the mysteries surrounding antimatter's origin in the universe are just beginning. Alright, this video ends here, thanks for watching. And if you find the content valuable, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and we will provide you with regular, in-depth explorations of the fascinating, strange and unknown aspects of the universe in which we reside.